listening to The Tiny Bloodthirster, a competitive Warhammer 40k podcast. Hello, I'm The Tiny Bloodthirster, and today we're going to look at some of the recent Warhammer 40,000 tournaments and the top lists from these events. Last month we got a new codex for Space Marines and Necrons. That's a lot of updates because this includes Space Wolves, Blood Angels, Dark Angels, uh, Death Watch as well. Uh, Since that update, I've been collecting tournament results, and today I will break it down into digestible nuggets. So how does this work? I look at recent GTs and majors, take all the lists that were greater than .79 win-loss. So basically that means you just have to get a 4-1 or better record. And then I break down how many of these lists, each codex, sub-faction, unit, warlord trait, and relic they appeared in. I'm using frontline gaming standards to determine what is or isn't a GT, so that means that the event has to have 28 or more players and 5 or more rounds. Uh, This does not have to be an ITC event to qualify though, Uh, I'm looking at stuff in Europe and Australia as well. Now the new codexes have been out for a few weeks, but not every event has used them. Uh, So I'm only focusing on the events that do use these codexes. So far that amounts to about 59 lists across 4 events. That's a smaller than average sample size for this time of year, but that's due to COVID and you should probably take some of this with a grain of salt. However, I think it'll still give us a good preview of what the meta is going to look like at your next GT or Major in the next few months. And then I plan to follow up on this again sometime in December and combine this data with the rest of November's and then show how every faction has performed. But for now, I'm just going to do a brief overview of all codexes and then do a really deep dive into Space Marines and Necrons. Starting with the codexes, uh, last time I collected data like this was in September. You can see the top codexes next to the recent results in my last episode, and uh, I also put them in this chart on your screen. This will let you see that the new codexes cause significant disruption in the meta for many armies. Uh, I also included the point of equality again. For those of you who weren't here last episode, the point of equality is kind of like a, a bright line I use to measure balance. Basically, if a codex is near the point of equality, then I consider it to be pretty balanced. If it's way higher than the point of equality, or if it's at zero, then it's broken or it's underpowered, re- uh, respectively. Uh, and most armies are close to it right now. The only exceptions are the top three, which are Marines, Demons, and Necrons. Uh, they've been very well represented at the top tables in the past couple weeks. Whereas the ones that are at zero right now are the Grey Knights and Imperial Knights. They've been in my charts in the past since the 9th edition dropped, but they've never been top tier. They've always kind of struggled to even get one or two lists in. Most of the recent top lists have been pretty much what you would expect, with the exception of the Space Marines and Necrons. Um, guard and Agmec lists are just usually tank gun lines screened by infantry. Custodes and Sisters rock their MSU archetype. Uh, all the Heretic Astartes still like to pair up with demons so they can do some Psyker shenanigans or monster shenanigans. Death Guard were one of the top three armies in the earlier meta, as you can see on the chart, but they've fallen quite a bit this month. Um, this could simply be because I've got a smaller sample size here than in September. So maybe it's just a fluke in the data, or eh, there can be something deeper here. Maybe Death Guard players don't want to bring their armies because they know they're getting a new codex next month, and maybe they want to try something else before their rules get completely changed, kind of like what happened to Necrons. Uh, Even Space Marines had some pretty significant changes in the way they're played. Uh, It could also mean that Death Guard players... Um, are trying to adjust to the meta and having a far, hard time finding that in their list. Uh, for example, Death Guard lists typically are very tank heavy, but there's a lot of Harlequins running around that can just blow those tanks up with ease. So it, it, it might be that they just don't feel the meta is appropriate for their current codex. Uh, next to the demons, they their lists don't mind being on their own, um, as well as with the Heretic Stardis because they are also a good counter faction to the high AP Space Marine list, because if I've got a high end, we'll say, what do I care about your AP for? Uh, I did find one Chaos Knight list, it was just Solo Knights. Um, the Eldar are still very Harlequin heavy, with the occasional Craftworld or Drakari support detachment. Uh, the Orcs are still just the Green Tide. 
Uh, the Tau, I have not really seen an archetype yet. They've been really struggling to even show up in the meta, and the couple of lists I have found in the past few weeks didn't have a lot of overlap between them. Tyranid lists are souped with Gene Stealer Cult pretty much every time, so they can create either a fast moving horde or a bunch of vehicle and monster combo, uh, like big heavy threat overload lists. Now let's drill down to the Adeptus Astartes and start by looking at how each subfaction performed. Uh, Dark Angels have really gone from zero to hero here. I don't think I've seen a single Dark Angel list at the top tables in this edition, and they were kind of rare in 8th edition too now that I think about it. The new Deathwing Bombs and Ravenwing characters are hot. The archetype is to basically you take a Ravenwing Apothecary plus a couple other Ravenwing characters, usually like a Talon Master or Bike Chaplain, and then you bring uh, somewhere between one and three Deathwing Bombs. It can be regular Deathwing, it can be Command Squad, it can be uh, Deathwing Knights, all of them are good. It's a great way to get Terminators into combat. The reason you bring Deathwing specifically is that they're always transhuman physiology, which makes them super tough to remove now, and they rightfully belong at the top of Stardust Podium. However, only four of the 11 Space Marine lists were Dark Angels, and that means they're just a plurality, not a majority. There were lots of other competitive Space Marine lists out there. Don't feel like you have to be Dark Angels, and don't feel like every single Space Marine player in your area is going to be a Dark Angel. Um, they, they just happen to be the, the top in this data set. Uh, close second were the Ultramarines and their Ultra Successors. Uh, they had a combined three lists, but they were all very different, and I didn't really see an archetype here. Uh, noticeably absent are the Salamanders. They have been the army to beat all edition, but it looks like the nerf to Master Artisan, plus the buffs to other sub-factions were enough to reel them in. Master Artisan in general has been nerfed enough that most top players are just avoiding it. There is really just that one list that you can see there. Uh, I, I don't think the Salamanders are unplayable, though. I think they have an archetype. Um, I kind of suspect that a lot of the Salamander players are holding out for the Eradicator box to come out, so that way it's easier to collect them, And because Melta on Salamanders is still really strong in their Super Doctrine. Um, it's just that it's not as amazing as it was before. So now, what units are being used in these armies? I kind of talked about the Deathwing already, but what else is out there? Uh, if we look at all Astartes lists, uh, we'll notice that the Apothecary variants are super popular here. I ended up grouping the Primaris Apothecary and Ravenwing Apothecary together, and I did that with a few other uh, units that were similar. But I kept the Sanguinary Priest separate from them. You can see he's kind of at the bottom, because he's an HQ and has slightly different auras. Uh, was that a mistake I made? I, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if you think I should combine Sanguinary Priest with the other Apothecary variants. But either way, Apothecary was top. Uh, the Wise Orator makes him really good, plus the 6-up and Feel No Pain aura is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, slightly below them are the Eradicators, but they are not being spammed, um, even though they can now take up to 18 models in most chapters. No one brought more than one unit of them in any of these lists. I, I kind of wonder if we'll see more of them once the multi-part kit comes out, because in my experience, the Eradicators will be super good. Especially if you're a Salamander or Death Watch list, because Death Watch can take even more of them, and they get all these rerolls built in. Uh, Raven Guard Eradicators can be hilarious if you're using them to target a Greater Demon list or a Hive Tyrant. Uh, one time in one of my games, a single unit of three Eradicators in their Super Doctrine from Raven Guard did 18 damage to my Impossible Robe and Corporal Form Lord of Change which that guy almost never dies. I could count on one hand out of the dozens of games I've played him in the number of times that that Lord of Change has actually died. So one Eradicator squad doing that by themselves is just amazing. A um, little bit fluky, but it's one of those things they can do. They just have a high damage ceiling. It's not that difficult when they can hit and wound on twos while benefiting from rerolls of a nearby captain and or lieutenant. Uh, next, the Humble Captain. He has been nerfed, but it's still a great HQ choice. He can hit hard, and at the same time, he can buff any core units that are nearby. Most players were using Jump Captains or Bite Captains, I noticed, so that they can jump from MSU to MSU and buff them at critical positions on the battlefield. 
Um, making your characters fast is just really big. If your army has access to that, then you should probably take advantage of it. And one thing that I kind of want to point out is that it was cool to see the OG tactical squad so high in the rankings. Then again, they are now the cheapest troop choice. So if you don't like spending points on Primaris, then this is really your only option. Personally, I've been consistently disappointed by Intercessor's offensive output. If you compare that to how many points you're spending this edition. So I might switch to Tactical Marines and have them babysit my objectives in my deployment zone instead of Intercessors. Because, I mean, Tactical Marines don't kill as much, but they're cheaper, which makes them more efficient if you compare their defensive capabilities to the points you're spending. The most popular ward trait was Selfless Healer. This is about 50% of the reason you take Apothecaries. I mean, did you lose an Eradicator? Then use the Warlord trait, bring him back to life, full HP, and that costs you no command points. Works on Invader ATVs too if you want to do some hilarious shenanigans. And they just FAQ'd it the other day and said that, well they said nothing about the Invader ATV. So I don't think that's going anywhere, you can keep doing that. Rights of War was also popular appeared in about 5 out of 11 of the Astartes lists. I've been using a lot in my games, but the Super Opsec has never mattered once for me. I mean, I can see ways that it could win the game, so it's a nice tool to have, but I don't think it's the auto-take like Selfless Healer is. I guess bring it if you have a CP and a non-Warlord character to spare. That's my recommendation. If we look at the relics, you can see that they're just all over the place. There's a lot of good ones, no clear winner. Uh, I was surprised to see Teeth of Terra at the top though. I guess it's useful on captains now that the hammer has been nerfed so hard. It's got a pretty decent damage output, and it costs zero command points because it just replaces a chainsword. I also should make a shout out to Reliquary if they're repentant, which can be important if you are Dark Angels and you have multiple Deathwing Bombs, because it gives a nearby unit a 5 up feel no pain. Blight Lords wish they were that durable, because now we're 3 wounds, we're 2 up armor, either a 4 or 5 up and we'll save depending on whether or not you brought the storm shield. Uh, it gives you 5 up funnel pain and you're, you can only be wounded on 4s. So overall, marines had got nerfed a little bit, going from 25% of the meta in September to 19% in more recent data. However, they are still a very powerful faction and they rightfully sit at the top of the pack thanks to some of the new archetypes that replaced the old salamander list. They, I think that they do require a little more finesse to win now. I've played maybe a dozen games either with the Codex or against a player who was using the Codex. And out of those maybe dozen games, I can only think of one of them where the Space Marines actually won. But my point is, don't go out, buy a Space Marine army, and expect to auto win with just any unit. It's going to take some practice, and you're going to have to have a dedicated plan of attack to succeed. Let's move on and talk about the Necrons. This new codex has given them lots of love. This might be the biggest gains they have ever gotten from a single book in any edition. Uh, the new data sheets and rules were just what the doctor ordered because they went from zero wins in September and being almost completely absent in eighth, only a handful of wins all edition. And now they're a whopping 12% of the meta since the codex dropped. I'm going to go over the same kind of stuff that I did for Marines, but I will say that I am not a Necron player myself, and I have yet to play against the new Codex. So if I get anything wrong, please just let everyone know in the comments below that I was wrong, and I promise my feelings won't be hurt. I'm making these videos to help everyone understand the meta and become stronger together, and we really can't do that if I give someone bad advice, so feel free to call me out. Let's talk about sub-factions now. So two sub-factions are standing out here. The Mephret Dynasty and the Custom Dynasty using Eternal Conquest, Relentlessly Expansionist. Mephret increases range, increases HP, and lets you get two directives at once during the Protocol of Vengeful Stars. So to non-Necron players, that means that Mephret can improve their AP even further and they ignore cover. So that can add up to a net of AP4 on a lowly Necron warrior with Goss Flare, if he's shooting at you while you're in cover. That's, that's really good, like armor just can disappear if you're stacking so many AP buffs. 
Internal Conquest gives you Super Obsec, and Relentless Expansionist gives everyone a Scout move of 6 inches. This is a great way to get your slow models into the midboard so they can grab objectives and complete actions on right away. So which sub-faction do you bring? You know, that's really a tactical decision to make, and I think Necron players are going to have to have more experience before they collectively decide on which one's the best one. Uh, so I guess the question is, do you want to destroy the foe with massed fire? Then bring Mefret. Do you want to dominate the board and play defensively? Then take that custom faction. Both of them are very strong though. I know my, for example, my Black Legion army would just wish their chapter tactics were half as good as either of these. Or, or hell, my, my demons have awful chapter tactics. I mean, if I had a Locus that could do what either of these armies could, that would just be amazing. But these are both good options. Uh, if we look at the specific units, I was just amazed at the sheer variety of Necron units represented. There, almost every single unit in the Codex was at one of the top tables. It, it just It's giving me flashbacks to 7th edition, when the Eldar Codex dropped and almost every single unit was useful in that book. So this is a great time to be a Necron, because almost every model is kind of strong. You could probably pick your favorite one, build a list around it, and it would probably have some potential. Uh, but remember that we are only a few weeks out from the Codex release, and they are all already this good. So I, I predict we're going to see more Necrons in the coming months, as more players optimize their armies for ninth, and you'll also see bandwagon players rush to start a new army here as well. Technomancers and Necron Warriors were one of the most popular units. They appeared at five of the top seven lists I found. Uh, the Technomancer is a nice healer unit that pairs especially well with Warriors, healing D3 instead of 1. And for 75 points, he's a pretty cheap HQ. I, I guess uh, you can think of this guy like a Diet Chief Apothecary. Uh, the Warriors are durable troops that can easily swarm the board in the Eternal Conquest, Relentlessly Expansionist Custom Dynasty. However, no one is really building swarms, surprisingly. The median number of units was two per list, and I don't think I saw anyone who brought more than 60 warriors. And definitely nobody brought more than three units of them in a single list. Canoptic Scarabs also deserve a special mention, considering they appeared in four out of the seven lists. So that means they're fast, they have lots of wounds. Uh, you can combine that with the fact that iconic reanimation protocols plus a healing ability are stacking together that makes them really great at clogging up the midfield and completing actions. And with Eternal Conquest, they make great objective babysitters, because now they're obsec. If we look at the Warlord traits, there's really no clear auto-take here, but Enduring Will seems to be the most popular. Minus one damage is really good, and any Zeech Demon or T-Suns player will tell you that. Most weapons that target your characters are three damage or less, so with this Warlord trait, you can potentially double your HP, and that's what makes it so good. Specific relics. Uh, most lists brought the Voltaic Staff. When I saw these stats, I was amazed. This might be one of the best shooting relics in the game. You get four shots with exploding sixes, and they're all two damage. You can potentially one-shot a Space Marine equivalent unit with it. See those intercessors over there? Gone. Uh, maybe not on average that'll work, but it, you have the potential to do it, and it is a lot of damage. It can also be wielded by the Technomancer, who doesn't mind hiding behind a screen of infantry, say 20 warriors, so he can heal them and provide some additional fire support with this relic. Overall, Necrons look like they're a very strong, durable list, and durability is what you want in this edition, because this edition's all about holding your objectives. You can shoot your opponent or stab them if possible, but holding objectives is probably the most important thing to do, and the Necrons just do that really well. We're, we're going to see more Necrons, I think, in the coming months, um, and it's a welcome sight. More variety of opponents means the game's a lot more fun and immersive. That covers it for today's episode. The data for today's events came from Vastris Autumn Bash, 2020 Renegade Mini GT, South Georgia Havoc GT, and WATC 2020. If you want to look at the list yourself, you can check out the first three on Best Coast Pairings, and WATC 2020 was on Down Under Pairings. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Again, all the charts from this episode are in the description along with a link to my Patreon. So, until next time, peace out!